Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Wake up, wake up, wake up. It's your girl, Reverend Rashida Lee. It is SGS Ministry Bible Study. Get up! I will bless the Lord at all times and His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Come on, get up, get up, get up. I am trying to bless the Lord with you, but you're not getting up. Hey, there you go, there you go, there you go. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all, it's Sunday, and it's 7 o'clock. What? It's 7 o'clock. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all. I see you, I see you, I see you. Oh, y'all was ready to get on. Y'all is jumping on like, what? <laughs> good morning. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, we bless your holy and righteous name. Father, we thank you for our opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you so much for waking us up this morning. You didn't have to, but you did. So we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We extol you, God. Father, we lift you up right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, God. Father, we ask you for a rhema word today. Heal, deliver, set free, God, and save today. Father, we thank you. We honor you. Father, we ask you for the Holy Spirit to just endow us, Father. We ask you for the Holy Spirit to sit with us today, God. We ask you for the Holy Spirit to do what he always does, Father. He always come through and show up. So, God, we ask you to bless us today. We ask you to cover us today. We ask you to continue to saturate us with your blood. Father, we thank you. We honor you. and We love you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, y'all. It's Sunday at 7 o'clock. It's your girl, Reverend Rashid with Sisters Going Strong. No woman left behind. Y'all on, y'all on. I see y'all. Y'all ready to study. Well, guess what? God didn't give me a, a book to study yet. So I'm going to, this is what was laid in my heart, to just show you all of the blessings and the miracles that he has done all the way to the end of the year. So last week we talked about when God blessed at the wedding and how he had um, the miracle. I talked about the miracle. And when I was in Jerusalem, I found um, a couple souvenirs. And one of the souvenirs that I found was the jug that was used at the wedding that God filled up. I was so excited when I found this because I wanted to show y'all that this is what the jug looked like when he filled up them six jugs with the 30 to 40 gallons of water and they turned them into wine. But imagine this being really, really huge. And this is what they used for ceremonial washing. They would fill these with water and pour them on them before <clears throat> they did any sacrifices and things of that nature. So this is what the jug looked like. I wanted to show you all that before we began. But today, I want to go to the book of Mark. I want to go to the book of Mark. And I want to talk about a, hill, a, a miracle that had taken place in the synagogue. So we're talking about religious people that seeing a miracle happen right in their face. That's what I want to talk about today. Um, my topic today was... Are you willing to stand in front of the people with your disability? Are you willing to stand in front of the people with your trials? Are you willing to stand in front of the people with your tribulations? Are you willing to stand in front of the people with your brokenness, with things that's going on in your life, with your broken relationships, with your broken job, with your broken marriage, with your broken body? Are you willing to stand in front of the people and let people see your issues? You know, we try to hide the things that we're going through. We try to hide so that nobody sees what we're going through. But sometimes, you know, the Lord uses you Oh my gosh, the Lord uses you to be the example of his glory. Somebody say, use me, Lord. Use my situation, use my trials, use my tribulations, use my issues, use the things I'm going through to help show people your glory. And that's what happened in this story today. So in Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, I'm going to dissect that word for you today. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Very, very short story, but it's impactful because I want you to know that God can use you in your mess. Somebody say, somebody, God, use me. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue. I'm reading from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Oh my God. <laughs> then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger 
and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. I'm just so excited because when I read this story and God laid this story on my heart, I'm like, oh my gosh, how many people is hurting right now? How many people is broken? How many people is going through so much? How many people is dealing with death of a loved one in this season? How many people is in their house crying and going through so many things with their children, their grandchildren, with their finances, with their bodies? How many people is going through so much and they go to church and dress it up and act like they don't want nobody to see? But in this story, God told the man with the shriveled hand to stand up in front of everyone. Now, mind you, they were in church. They were in the synagogue. So they were in a place of worship. And while they were in a place of worship, these people believed in God. They believed in the laws of Moses. So they believed in all these laws. So they were dignified. A lot of them understood. And a lot of people were there to receive healing. They were there to receive God. And this particular man, he didn't have a name. And y'all know last time I told y'all to put your name in the, in the story, right? So I'm going to ask you to put your name in the story again today. Because when he spoke to the man, he didn't say his name. He just spoke to his issue. He just spoke to his situation. He just spoke to the area that was already going through a problem. And we get so caught up in thinking that God's not going to heal us. We get so afraid that God's not going to do that same miracle for me. But the, in the Bible, this man didn't have a name. So I urge you, I beseech you, brethren, to put your name in the word. Because it says another time, Jesus. Now that means that Jesus was in the synagogue before. Oh my God, this wasn't his first time in the synagogue healing. He didn't heal one time in the synagogue. This was another time. Somebody say another time. And like I told y'all before, if he did it before, he'll do it again. If he came before, he'll come again. If he healed before, he'll heal again. If he showed a miracle sign and wonder before, he'll show a miracle sign and wonder again. It says another time Jesus went to the synagogue. And a man or a woman... Come on, put your name in the word. And a woman named Rashida was with a shriveled hand. Come on, you got to put your name in the word so you can hear the story. Rashida was in there in this synagogue dealing with debt. Rashida was in the synagogue dealing with her daughter about to turn 18 and doing with trying to do whatever she want to do. Trying to smoke weed, trying to run around, trying to do all these things. I was in the synagogue dealing with all these issues of my life. And guess who sees me? Guess who have an encounter with me? Guess who looks at me? It says, and a man with the shriveled hand was there. What is your issue? What is your problem? What are you dealing with today? Not last week, not last month. But what are you dealing with today? And you're on live right now. And you are about to go to the synagogue and you taking your bags with you. You taking your junk with you. You taking your problems with you. And guess who shows up while you're there? Jesus shows up. And when he show up, he looks at you. He don't look at nobody else. Everybody in the room got an issue. Everybody in the room got a problem. Everybody in the room is dealing with so many things. But he looks at you. It says... Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Now, this is what the part that messed me up was because they watching Jesus, but they already knew something was wrong with this man. If they knew something was wrong with their brethren, why didn't they take the blessings of God that was on them and try to heal him? The power that they had inside of them, why didn't they lay hands on their friend? Why did they lay hands on this man? Why did they lay hands on the man that was sitting there with his hand all shriveled up? Why can't they use the God that they serve to say, God bless this man that keep coming to the synagogue with us? We know something wrong with him. And we know you bless. We know you heal. We know you deliver. So why are you not helping him? Why can't you give us the power to bless this man? But they they rather let him suffer they rather let him deal with the issue that he had and say, well, if God going to do it, we're going to watch him and see. We're going to let him stay like that for the next 10 years. We're going to let him keep coming to the synagogue every month at the month. 
Year after year, with their kids, no one ain't got nothing to eat. We're going to let them keep coming to the synagogue knowing they homeless. We're going to keep letting them come to the synagogue knowing they ain't got no money. We're going to keep letting them come to the synagogue knowing they ain't got no house. We're going to keep letting them come to the synagogue knowing they don't have no clothes. We're going to keep letting them come to the synagogue knowing. Knowing. We know our, our, our uh, Christian brothers and sisters is dealing with issues. And we just watch them. We're going to see how long they can make it through. We're going to see how long they can get it together. We're going to just watch and see how long they're going to cry. We're going to watch and see how long their marriage is going to be a mess. We're going to watch and see how long their kids is going to be messed up. We're going to watch and see. They knew he had a problem. But they watch you come to church. They watch you drag your issues to church. They watch you complain and cry. They watch you go to the pastor, the pastor study week after week, begging for help. They watch you. And they have the power inside of them to help. But they choose not to. But they rather kill the one that was willing to help you. They wait to see if God gonna bless you. They wait to see if God gonna do it for you. They wait to see if the glory of the Lord is going to shine on you. They wait to see if he's going to give you the anointing. They wait and watch. It says, so they watch Jesus closely to see if he will heal him on the Sabbath. I love this because the Sabbath, the word Sabbath is a Hebrew word, which means Shabbat. It's S-H-A-V-A-T. In the Jewish, in the Jewish customs, Shabbat, was a day of rest. It's a day of rest, rest and worship. And Sabbath, the Sabbath day was literally given to us to have rest as Jesus had rest. When God made the earth and he took six days to complete it, he had the seventh day to rest. So he gave us that same thing, the opportunity to go from an unhurried world, an unhurried day, you know, we have so much going on. We're so busy. And he said, I'm going to give you one day to rest like I had. I was busy for six days getting this world together. And I'm going to give you one day to rest. So he gives us this one day to rest. And they said, on that day, because what the law says it by Moses, that law said that you're not supposed to do anything on the Sabbath day. And because in those times, the rule was don't work. Don't do nothing with your your ox, your cattle. Don't do nothing but sit home, rest, and worship God. That was the rule. That was the law. And Jesus said, when I came, I came to fulfill the law. I didn't come to abolish the law. I come to fulfill it. And he wants them to know that I am only trying to heal this man on the Sabbath day. Now, y'all been seeing that he was hurting. Y'all been seeing that he was in pain. But you rather allow him to be in pain because of the Sabbath day, because it's Sunday. Now, the Jewish custom, they don't honor the Sabbath day on Sunday as Christians do. They honor the Sabbath day on Friday night till Saturday night, which is Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. So they stay in the house. They don't move outside. They don't be in the streets. They don't be at the mall. They don't be at Walmart. They don't be at Wawa. They make sure they have all things necessary in their house so they can rest with their family and worship. And I seen it for myself when I was in Jerusalem. I literally seen that the streets were empty on the Sabbath day. We got there on Friday and we got there on Friday. They did not let us go into the hotel to check in until sundown. Oh my gosh. I couldn't believe it. And they did not come out of their house, out of the hotel until Saturday sundown. Even the lights in the hotel, they had these little TV lights where you couldn't even turn the lights on bright because it was supposed to be like dim in the rooms. Even in the bedrooms, the beds were separated in the rooms purposely. Like the queen beds, the queen and king beds were separated purposely so the wife and the husband wouldn't have sex in the rooms during that time. Oh my gosh. This is how strict they are about their religion and about the rules and the laws. So, when I read this, I'm like healing on the Sabbath. They followed the rule to the they followed the rule to the letter. So the Bible says in Matthew chapter. Let, let me let me go to Exodus chapter twenty first. Let's go to Exodus chapter twenty verse eight. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It says, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Miss Debbie, I ain't put my tabs in. <laughs> Don't kill me. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now, the Sabbath day is Sunday for us. But now, you know, years ago when I was little, the malls weren't open on Sundays. You couldn't go to the store, 7-Eleven. None of that stuff was open on Sundays. Now, everything is open on Sundays. I mean, it's crazy. Everything's open. It's not honored at all. Nobody keeps it holy because the owners of the properties are not religious. They're worried about money and finances and how they're going to make more money. So now, they're like, we're not closing on no Sunday. You know, the only business that I still know that is closed on Sunday is Chick-fil-A. And Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays because he is a Catholic and he still believes in the Sabbath day. He believes that that day is a day of worship and holiness. And he's not going to sacrifice his own self to be closed. He's going to sacrifice his whole business to be closed. And guess what? Because of him believing in the Sabbath and believing in the, the rule that God has given him, his businesses have been flourishing more and more. God gave him more than enough on Monday to Saturday that he don't have to open on Sunday. What? Why is that? Because you got to believe in your heart what God says about the word, right? Even though we're under the, the under grace and mercy, we don't follow the law to the letter. But because God didn't demolish the letters, he didn't take away the letters. He came to fulfill the letter, right? The letter of the law. So we have to keep this day holy. Now, my Sabbath day, because Sunday is a day that I have so much to do. My Sabbath day, I thought made my Sabbath day a Monday, the Monday that I can rest. So I turn my phone off. I try not to do many things on Sunday so that I can rest and be at home. Because my life is busy, like everybody's life. Everybody is busy from Monday to Saturday or Saturday to Monday or Tuesday to Saturday, whatever it is. Six days you are supposed to work and the other day you're supposed to have a day of rest. So find your day of rest, but you need a Sabbath day. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you la shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath up to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. Now, this is where they were trying to accuse Jesus of working on the Sabbath day, which means they were saying that he was healing on the Sabbath day. It says you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any farm residing in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested. Somebody say he rested. He rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So this day, when you take that day of rest, that day is for you and the Lord. Amen. Amen. So it says, nor your animals, nor any farm residing in your towns. So, in, in not in this chapter, but in um the book of Luke. I'm going to go to the book of Luke um, in a minute. But um in Luke, Jesus said to them, if you had a sheep that was falling, would you take your sheep and pull them up? And they like, yeah, because that sheep is their money. They sell their sheep to make money. They use them sheep for sacrifices. So he said, if your sheep is about to fall in a ditch on a Sunday or on a Sabbath day, would you not get it? You don't want me to heal this man on the Sabbath. But if your sheep was falling, you would get it. But it says in the word in Exodus 20, neither your animals nor any farm residing in your town. So nobody should do no work, not even the sheep, not even the ox, nothing. So God said, oh, so if I do work on the Sabbath, it's a problem and you want to kill me. But when you do work, it's okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. It says, this is Jesus speaking. He was on the, um, um, and on the Beatitudes, he was, excuse me, on the Mount of Olives. It says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. So he don't want to take away what the prophets said, what the Moses of the prophet was saying. He says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Somebody say everything will be accomplished. Everything. So let's go to Matthew 22, 34. Matthew 22, 34. 
It says, I'm going to go to 34 to 40. Matthew 22, 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, we just read one of the laws out of the book of Exodus. Now, we know that the Ten Commandments was in the book of Exodus chapter 20, all of the Ten, the ten Commandments. And they want to know what is the greatest command in the law? Now, mind you, we just read that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill them. And Jesus replied, verse 37, Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. His greatest command was to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, will you see your neighbor in church suffering and not help them on Sunday? Or will you let them continue to walk in the door the same way, walk out the door the same way, walk in the door the same Sunday, walk out the door the next Sunday, walk in the door next Sunday, and walk out the following Sunday? How many times will you let them continually walk in knowing they're broken, knowing they're hurting, knowing they're in pain, knowing they're dealing with issues, and you are not there to help them. God was telling them, Jesus was saying to them, you're so mean and angry that you'd rather let somebody suffer in the synagogue of one that loves God, one that wants to help. You'd rather let them suffer. When I told you the greatest commandments was to love the Lord God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. If you love yourself enough, you will not let yourself keep suffering as well as your brethren. Let's go to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 40 to 34. John chapter 13, verse 40. I'm in the wrong chapter. No, I'm in the wrong, wrong, wrong. John chapter 13, verse 34. I'm sorry. John 13, verse 34. Jesus was speaking to his disciples. Well, he's speaking actually when he's talking to Peter. And he says, John chapter 13, verse 34. A new command I give you. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When you bless somebody else, when you are willing to stop for a moment and hold their hand and pray with them, when you see them crying, when you see them suffering, you are showing that you are a disciple. You are showing that you love one another. You might not like the situation that they're in. You might not like what they're going through. You might not like your neighbor. But if you're willing to say, I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to help you. What is it that I can do? That is what God says. That God and everyone will know that you are a disciple. And you are loved by him. We have to be willing to show love no matter what day of the week it is. Let's go on. So let's go back to Mark. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. So it says, <clears throat> Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. I love this because when we go to the church, when we go to conferences, when we go to women fellowships, when we go to men fellowships, when we are around other believers, we want to seem so dignified. We want to seem like nothing is wrong with us. We want to seem like we all together. We want to look good. We want to feel good. We want to act like our hair is all done. Oh my God, I got myself together. My money is right. My house is right. My kids is right. My finances right. My marriage is right. My relationships are right. My body is right. And God said, I know your hand is shriveled. I know your relationship is tattered. I know your family is broken. I know your job is at the brink of being over. I know your body is in, in, in the need of healing. I know what you're going through. But you keep coming to me like nothing is wrong in the synagogue. So he says to stand up in front of everyone. That means I want you to testify. I want you to say I'm hurting. I want you to say I'm in pain. I want you to let the people know that something is wrong with me and I need help. He wants you to tell somebody my children is hurting. My grandkids is in jail. So much is going on and I need help. But we get in a point where we like, 
I don't want nobody to know. I don't want nobody to see me. I'm going to hide. I'm not going to come to church this week. I'm not going to go next week. I'm going to just stay in my own little bubble. I don't need to be bothered. I'm not going to tell my family what's going on with me. I'd rather go into foreclosure. I'd rather my house would just be done. Instead of saying, help me. And be willing to stand up in front of the people. God says, stand up in front of everyone. Don't be afraid to let the people know that you need help. People always say, she you just tell everything. Well, guess what? Me telling people that I was going through issues with my marriage, me letting people know what I was dealing with, I had so many people praying for me, so many people praying for me, that not only was my marriage healed, my marriage was restored. Because I was willing to let people know I'm suffering. I don't want my children to grow up without their father. I don't want my children to grow up with a, a house that's broken. You got to be willing to tell somebody. You got to be willing to open your mouth and stand up in front of everyone. And say, I'm in pain. My leg hurt. My knee hurt. What can I do? Somebody help me. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good? Or to do evil. To save life. Or to kill. But they remained silent. That's what some of us do. We watch. And we remain silent. I ain't saying nothing. I ain't got to do it. That's their business. I ain't going to get into that. They'll be alright. They'll get it together. Well you know. They need help. It says, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. If I could ask you right now, I don't know what's in your hand. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know if you're sitting still. I don't know what you're doing, but I need you to take your right hand and just stretch it out. Stretch out your right hand. When I studied this, I was so, I was so discombobulated because I couldn't believe the thing that, that God says about the right hand. Now this man's hand was shriveled, which means it was weak and twisted. It was kind of almost like a, a rheumatoid arthritis at that we, as we know, where you can't even use it. It's dried up. You can't use it. It's, it's bent. It's twisted. It has a bodily imperfection and it's weak. And what I learned about the hand was that the hand of a man or a woman symbolizes labor and service. When you have hands that are able to work, these are they are used for labor and service. But when you no longer have your hands, you are not able to do any work. And the hand comes with blessings. The right hand comes with blessings. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. It says, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season to bless all the work of your hands. He will bless the work of your hands. But if your hand is shriveled and not working and not doing any work, how can he bless your hands so that your, your, the work that you've done can be bountiful? You got to do some work with your hands. Your hands is meant for work, labor, and service. It says, you will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. You will have so much in your hands because of your working that you will be a lender and not a borrower. That's what the Bible says. When they say, I'm a lender and not a borrower. I'm above and not beneath. That comes from the word of God where he says that I will bless the, I will open up the heavens and bless your hands with bounty because of your work and your service. Oh my gosh. It also says in the book of Ephesians, let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter one, verse 20. Ephesians chapter one, verse 20. It says, Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to start at, I'm going to start at, um, brr, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this verse 20. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. He exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, 
right here, the right hand um, talks about the carrying of the anointing through the hand. The virtue is transferred for healing. And when he is seated at the right hand, the right hand is literally for the anointing. When they lay hands, oh my God, when you lay hands, the anointing goes through the, the hands. It's the virtue of the power that's inside of you goes through your hand. And that's how the anointing is transferred. So when you stretch out your hand and you're willing to stand and somebody's willing to touch you and somebody's willing to touch your hand, that's where the virtue transfers. Don't just be willing to say you see somebody crying or going through something and you say, I'm going to pray for you. Grab their hands so that the virtue of the anointing can transfer from you to them so that blessings can happen. That's how it is transferred through your hands. That's why they have the laying of the hands. It's through the hand that the virtue is transferred. The hand of a man is, um, the hand of a man in spiritual warfare represents the weapon and the finger symbolizes the tactics. If the hand is withered, it means the hand will not succeed either physically or spiritually. It is handcuffed, bewitched, and defiled. In this particular text, they were basically saying that the man's hand was cursed. When your hand is withered, they were saying that it was cursed. But when he had an encounter with Jesus, oh my gosh, the hand came back to life. You can't have an encounter with Jesus if you're not willing to stand up in front of everyone with your issue. If you're not willing to stand up to God and tell him what's really wrong with you. If you're not willing to stand up and say, this is my problem. I'm willing to stand up and stretch out in the area that I'm broken, in the area that I'm weak, in the area that I'm suffering. Go to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 18. Mark chapter 16, verse 16 to 18. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. That means they will be judged. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. Now you can't drive out demons without saying in Jesus name, they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands and when they drink deadly poisons, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Somebody say, I have that kind of power inside of me to lay hands on sick people and they will get well. We have that same power that when somebody is sick, you don't have to look at them in church. You can take that same virtue inside of you in your hands, lay hands on them, and you can heal them. And they will get well. You have the same power. So let's go back because I'm, I'm, I'm over time. It said Mark chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. I'm almost finished. Somebody said she almost finished. It says, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand. Now somebody said he listened. He listened. He didn't look at God and say, huh? Stretch out my hand. They didn't believe in Jesus because mind you, they were Jews. Remember, they were Jews, so they believed in the law. So as he was looking at Jesus Christ, he probably was like, stretch out my hand. Like what? God tell us to move and we still stand still. God tell us to leap and we still sit, sit down. God tell us to go and we still look. God tell us to fast and we be like, I'm hungry. He tell us what to do and we don't listen. But this man with a shimmel hand, with an issue, he said, I'm going to stretch out my hand. And he did it immediately. He stretched out his hand and his hand was completely restored. <laughs> immediately, you got to do what God says and not be questioning it. It says it was completely restored. It wasn't just restored. It was completely restored. Completely is just a word to emphasize restored. Why didn't God just heal him? You know the difference with healing and restoration. I, I, I had to look it up because I'm like, okay, if we get healed, 
Why is he not just healed? But healing is a word that means to, um, it's a, it's a process of restoring health. When you are in the process of healing or when you're healed, it is a process of restoring health. So healing takes place, but it becomes a process. It's over, it's over time, right? When you're healing, you, 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 you say if somebody did something to you and you're telling the story and you get so upset. And you get frustrated. Oh my gosh, I'm just, I, you tell a story as if it just happened and it happened 10 years ago. And then you tell a story probably a year later and you can tell it, but it ain't, it don't hurt as bad. And then you tell it 10 years later and now you're laughing about it. It was a process, right? It's a healing. Healing takes a process of restoration. But when you're restored, restoration is to be cured and to make well. It's something or someone, um, to an earlier condition. It's better than it was than to begin with. When you're restored, it's better than it was to begin with. Now, healing is a process to get to the place of being restored. But when you're restored, you're better. It's in an abundance. It's a greater abundance. That's why he didn't just heal him. He restored him. So now his hand will be able to work even harder and even greater for all the time that he lost. Now he can work even harder now. God not only restored his hand, he said, I will restore the creation. I will make it greater than it was before. Your issue will be greater. You won't have the problem that you had. You won't be like, oh, I'm better now. No, you will be restored. Full restoration. You will not just be in the process of healing. You will be completely restored when you are willing to be honest. And say, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. I'm dealing with so much. What is it that I need, God? I'm standing up in front of everyone. I'm broken. I'm tattered. I'm torn. I have issues. My tribulation is taking me, is overtaking me. You have to know that not only was his hand completely restored, but he was able to now work again. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. They were so mad that the glory of God showed on this man. Now he did it in front of everybody. He didn't hide. He made sure he did it in front of everybody. When God bless you, he's going to bless you in front of everybody. He's going to make sure that they see the glory of God on you. They're going to make sure they see when you walk in, they're going to be like, oh, what happened to him? Oh my God, what happened to her? Why she look so different? What is it about her? They're going to see the glory of the Lord on you. They're going to know that you had an encounter with Jesus. They're going to know that it wasn't just you. They knew that you was messed up. They knew that you couldn't stop crying. They knew you had an issue. They knew you had a problem. But they're going to know that you were with Jesus. Stop trying to do it on your own. You got to have an encounter. So you can be completely restored. That is my teaching for the day. Mark chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. I have a few announcements to make before I pray. Our fast begins today. I don't know if you have the text messages that I would send out. But if you do not, I need you to text capital SGS to the number 474747 so you can receive all the text messages. We will be fasting from today until December 17th to our sixth annual women's conference. Well, men can come too, not just women, our annual conference. And I'm asking you to write down today what it is that you need from God. Where do you need complete restoration at? What area of your life or for somebody else? But this, these 21 days will be your 21 days for you to get a greater relationship with God so you can have an encounter with him. 21 days. A fasting. You can do the Daniel fast. You can give up one thing, two things. But I need it to be something, a full sacrifice to kill this flesh. What is it that your flesh needs to have that you can't do without? Daniel, we're going to be studying the book of Daniel on our own. I gave you full scriptures to read every single day so that you can read and receive the word of God. Daniel had visions. The Bible says in Acts that, that women and men will have visions of, and visions. So maybe God will give you a vision during these 21 days. But whatever it is, I need you to fast. I need you to take this time, these next 21 days, so that you can be completely restored for 2023. You don't want to go into 2023 taking the same 
old stuff with you. We ain't taking the same bags with us. We're not taking the same issues. We're not taking the same tribulations. We're not taking the same story. Our story shall change on December 17th. We will have an encounter with Jesus. We're having a worship service. It's going to be more worship than word. I do have a woman coming named Michelle Washington. She will be giving us a word. I have a woman, um, Prophetess Faraby. She will be giving us a word. I have TJ Wilkins. They will be coming in song. I have Barbara Mills. She will be coming in song. And myself, I will be teaching the word of God as well. In two hours, you will receive the anointing that, oh my God, like never before. Our story will change on December 17th. If you are going with us on December 17th at 332 Mixed Crab House, it's all you can eat shrimp and it's um like other food that's gonna be there as well. I need your um $55 by Friday if you are going. Um, you don't have to go, but it's just a time of fellowship because we don't get to be together often. So I would love to see you there if you are able to make it. I really want you there December 17th at 12 o'clock at 804 Wall Street in Chester PA. It's a 90 year ballroom. Also, Next Sunday, December 4th, I will be in the building. I will be in the building at Sanaidi or Ballroom at 8 a.m. for communion service. I will also be on live. But at 3 o'clock, I will be at Murphy Church preaching. They have a um, class day, and I am the speaker for the day. I really would love to see you there to come and worship with me on December 4th at 3 o'clock. It's on Murphy Church. It's um, off of 7th Street um, near the Leak Center. Murphy AME. Um, also... This Tuesday, I had so many gently used clothes that we're going to be giving out gently used clothes again on Tuesday at the ballroom at 12 o'clock. And also we'll be giving out lunch. We have um, chicken breast salmon, um, string beans, green beans. We have rice. We have chili. We'll be giving out lunch on Tuesday at 12 o'clock. So if you're available, if you're not doing anything on Tuesday at 12 o'clock, come on by and help us um, serve or come on and get, some, get a plate for somebody. Take it back to their home um, for a loved one. Oh, thank you, Cola. Yes, 7th and Yarnall. 7th and Yarnall Street in Chester, PA is where Murphy AME Church is located. Thank you. Um, And what else? I think that's it. So, I'm excited. Please read your scriptures in the book of Daniel today. Please begin to fast if you're able to. If you're taking medicine, you know, make sure that you don't do anything to hurt yourself. But um, I really want us to be completely restored for December 23rd. And please share this live. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal, Father, we bless your holy and righteous name. Father, we thank you so much for complete restoration. Father, we thank you in advance for complete restoration. Father, we thank you so much for the man with the shriveled hand that we come to you, Lord, broken. Some of us come to you, you know, with issues, with problems, with things, with our finances, with our body, with our health, with our families, with our jobs, with our businesses. Father, we need you right now with our children, with our grandchildren. Father, we need you in our marriages, in our relationships. Father, we need you, Father, we need you. So, Father, we ask you to allow us to stand up in front of everyone and to show your glory. Use us for your glory, God. Use us. Let us be the one that your glory is shown through. Anoint us afresh for this next journey, God. Let us not do it alone. You said in your word that you will never leave us or forsake us. You will go before us. So, Father, go before us. The enemy already has a diabolical assignment waiting to destroy us, to kill us, to take everything from us. But, Father, we ask you to cover us with your blood. Father, put a hedge of protection around us, God. Father, we ask you to anoint us afresh. God, sit in the boat with us as you did with Peter. God, we thank you. We thank you so much for your word to show us that we can put our name in the word and it will happen for us. So, Father, we thank you. We honor you. Somebody that was on this live today that don't know you in the part of their sins, they don't believe. Father, let them believe that you can do the same thing for them as, they, as you did for the man with the shriveled hand. Father, let them believe with sincerity in their heart, that they want to change, that they want to be able to do right, that they want to believe, they want to, they want to love you. So, Father, with their words, the Bible says that we can confess with our mouth and believe with our heart that Jesus is Lord, that he died on the cross for our sins, and we will be immediately saved just like that. No cartwheels, no splits. We don't got to run to the altar. We don't got to do anything. We can just say with our heart that we believe. So if you're on here and you have backslidden, you have been in a place where you just don't know who Jesus Christ is and you want to know him. You want him to do the same thing to you as he did to the man with the shriveled hand. You want to be completely restored. You don't want to just be healed. You want to go through the process. You want to just be healed. You can do that today. If you repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. And I believe you came to earth. And I believe you died on the cross for me. And I believe you shed your blood for me. And I believe you rose from the dead. Right now, 
I come to you, Lord Jesus, because I am a sinner. Forgive my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Make me clean. And I will be clean. Come into my heart. Save my soul. I no longer belong to Satan. I belong to you. I am forever yours. And I am now saved. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Please share this live. Please let somebody know that God still heals. He still delivers. And he still sets free. And he's still completely restoring the believer. You got to believe them. I love y'all. God bless you. Have an amazing and awesome week. And if you can, get up, get dressed, and go to the sanctuary.